So I'm joined uh, today on the YouTube channel doing another interesting uh, medically themed interview. So um, I came across Dr. Sandra Evans, who goes by Dr. Sandy, uh, has an amazing video up on YouTube, which I will link to in the description about basically post gallbladder and why challenging the consensus view that cholecystectomy or gallbladder removal is this harmless, uh, harmless operation that myself and I would say tens of thousands of uh, post people that have had this surgery kind of see themselves putting on weight and having other problems and kind of say this doesn't feel like such a harmless operation. So um, Dr. Sandy, your video talked about stuff that for non-scientists like me is a little, we can kind of get the basics about this thing called uh, GLP-1 and signaling. And um, I guess I thought it'd be amazing. And thank you very much for, uh, for doing this video interview. Um, I thought it'd be great to firstly discuss in a bit more detail what you were saying, talk about in that YouTube video. And uh, secondly, maybe for people for whom this information is too late, we've already had the operation. We're not getting all, our gallbladders back anytime soon, i.e. ever. Uh, if there's <laughs> any, any, thoughts, any thoughts you have about ways we could um, achieve, as your slogan goes, better body chemistry. Okay. Let's just go back to the, the principle of how bile is working. So um, as soon as you eat, what happens is there is a signaling system that goes to actually tell you that you have eaten. And what's very interesting about it is that one of the first signals is in actual fact the release of bile acids. So within five to 20 minutes of you eating something, what has already happened is the gallbladder has contracted and squirted the bile into the duodenum and mm -hmm. it begins to do all sorts of signaling. Okay, so the, one, the, the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine, right? Intestine, yes. Mm -hmm. So there are in fact signal, there, there are receptors inside of the duodenum that pick up the message that the bile acids have arrived. So there are two of them that they know a lot about. So one is the FXR and the other one is, um, it's called the Takeda 5G protein. So these guys are actually sending messages and they send messages to the liver. They send messages to the pancreas. They send messages all over the place. So one of the places they send a message to is the pancreas. And that then causes an increase in the release of that hormone that you asked me right at the beginning, GLP-1. Mm -hmm. So GLP-1 is actually released and it then tells the pancreas to produce insulin. So bile acids are very much involved in glucose regulation. Okay. Is, does this process of the messaging, the release of bile, something I've struggled to find out is whether this is just something that happens in response to fatty meals or if it's like literally every time that we eat is there any data about that it's actually every time we eat all right because it turns out that there are two signaling systems that tell the gallbladder when to release um the the bile mm. so the one is actually um the a thing called the sphincter of od which is a connection um, so as food arrives into the gut that connection is going to trigger but on top of that, the more fat there is in the meal, that also is going to cause the gallbladder to trigger. So the, there's a hormone called cholecystokinin, which does that. So the two actually work together. So mm -hmm. if you're not eating a meal that's very fatty, you're still going to get bile acids released, mm -hmm. but a much smaller quantity. Okay. The more, more fats that are there, the bigger the quantity. And it makes sense because you are looking for those fats to actually digest or the, those bile acids to digest the fat. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that probably makes the situation, I guess, uh, even worse for post cholecystectomy because even if we eat a low fat diet, we're not, uh, we're not just kind of getting rid of the job of bile. It would already have been working if we had our gallbladder. So I guess we have e even more work to do. The problem, if we just look at it, is it's actually a concentration problem. Mm -hmm. So if you have a look what the job of the gallbladder was, the gallbladder essentially 
your body is actually producing bile acids pretty much all the time, although it does have peaks. So mm -hmm. there's times that it produces more, more and times it produces less. But what happens is it all gets channeled to the gallbladder where it gets stored. And actually inside of the gallbladder, it get, doesn't just get stored, it also gets concentrated. So by the time it's squirting into your duodenum, the level is much, much higher. And the typical levels that are reached in somebody after they've eaten a meal, an average meal, is in the 30 millimolar range. So the levels are extremely high. Okay. And it's, it's the fact that they go high for a very short period of time is part of the signaling. So as they go high, they're then going to knock sort of knock onto all of those receptors. The receptor that I told you about, the FXR receptor. Mm -hmm. The FXR receptor then sends a message back to the gallbladder and says, oh, well, you know what? Food has arrived. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, so the difference between someone with a gallbladder and someone without is not that how much bile acid is produced, it's the fact that there's a peak and a trough every time you eat. And as a consequence of that, you get different signaling. So when, when you haven't got a gallbladder, the levels are actually kind of at the same level all of the time. Mm -hmm. They estimate it's around eight millimolar. So it okay. is actually very interestingly enough, probably enough for you to metabolize fat. Maybe not well, but you can metabolize, which is one of the reasons why doctors have said, oh, well, you know what? You can take the gallbladder out because the bile acids are still there. And you know what? They're also enough for you to digest fat. It's not a problem. And it's probably true. The problem is you needed the signaling. Mm. The signaling required a high and a low level. Okay. And you've lost the ability to get that high and that low level. Makes sense. Amazing. I guess the obvious question is for people who've already had the operation, uh, we don't have this kind of elaborate signaling process. And as you say, our uh, bile levels are flatlining. The liver never knows it's eaten. The pancreas never doesn't get that message as well. So um, obviously, you know, everybody's going to react to the operation differently. And all this area is very uncertain. Uh, do you have any ideas what people who've had this operation could do to try, I don't know, supplements or diets to try to replicate maybe artificially this signaling process or at least to make the best of a uh, unfortunate body chemistry situation? Yeah, well, I think the first bit of advice that I would give is not about food um, because what's happened is essentially you've lost that signaling system. It's not there. So the food is not or, or is not going to be that good at being able to set the circadian rhythm. So mm -hmm. I think for somebody who has had their gallbladder out, if they understand the fact that they are now no longer in the same position to actually control their circadian or their rhythms. So they've lost that feeding rhythm. It becomes much more important that you do other things to make sure that your circadian rhythm is tight. You, you, you need to actually work on your rhythm because you've lost one of the players that helps to set that rhythm. Mm. And if you look at how is the rhythm set, the, the official term for it is, it comes from German, they call them Zeitgerbers, which are time setters. So feeding was an important time setter and the bile acids play a role in that time setting. But probably the most important way of setting the time in your body is actually through light. Mm -hmm. So somebody who has had their gallbladder out, they need to be very, very careful and manage their light exposures very well so that they can help their body know to now is daytime and now is nighttime. And unfortunately, as we're living in the modern era, most of us are actually not that good at knowing whether it is daytime or nighttime. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Because what is happening to us is we spend a lot of time indoors. Now you say, but it's light indoors during the day. What's the problem? The problem is that the level of light inside is nothing like the level of light outside. So even if you're in a really well lit, lit room, mm -hmm. they measure light, by the way, in a thing called lux. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a, a really well lit room, so you're in a nice, you're in a nice fancy office, it's got good lighting, you're probably at the best of times getting around 300 to 500 lux. If you go outside on a really lousy day, I know you came from Ireland, so you probably mm -hmm. can identify cloudy days all the time, right? Yeah. If you go outside on a really lousy day, you would be getting 10,000 lux. Oh, wow. It's a huge difference. If it's start. a sunny, lovely day, like I live in South Africa, so it's a nice sunny day, right. sun is out, it could be 100,000 lux. And this now has a big impact on your circadian rhythm because your body is expecting to get a big boost of light, particularly in the morning. If you are now inside all the time, you aren't getting that boost of light. And so it actually becomes a problem. Your body actually doesn't realize that it is in fact daytime. Mm. So that's our first problem. But then we have a new problem. At night, what do we do? We have the electrical lights on. And although maybe we tone the lights down so it's not as, as bright a light, we still have the lights on. And even a tiny little bit of light although it wasn't enough to give you that knowledge that it was in fact the middle of the day, mm. it is enough to confuse you and to think that it's not the middle of the night. So managing your circadian rhythm through light is probably, it's important for everybody. It's not just for somebody who doesn't have a gallbladder. Right. It really is important. But for someone without a gallbladder, you've lost the other Zeitgerber, you've lost the bile acid. So you must make sure that you use the Zeitgerbers that you actually have access to. And light is very important. Maybe what I should just say is um, when you put on weight and you have all the metabolic problems, they talk about it as being insulin resistant. They also talk about it as metabolic syndrome. Mm. There are many people who are trying to have the name of metabolic syndrome changed to actually say it's a circadian metabolic syndrome. In other words, part of the problem in somebody who's insulin resistant is that they are already not going through that cycle well. Mm they find that the insulin levels are high during the day and at night. So it's already a problem. It's setting, setting a problem in normal people. Now with the gallbladder out, it's going to be even more important that you actually get that rhythm. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yeah. I'm. Uh... I'm, it's funny that I'm actually doing this interview uh, from outside. outside. I don't usually do in the morning, but I guess it's these little habits you can get into. Another one I do that's probably going to sound crazy to a lot of people, but you've you, you, you've made me feel a bit less a bit less insane. I've actually always had sort of difficulty in getting to bed at a healthy hour. So something I started doing a few years ago is, I presume in South Africa, you have this uh, black insulation tape, the kind of stuff they sell in hardware stores. So I actually started, again, it sounds crazy, covering up, led lights in my bedroom so that when it's time to sleep but imax as well it's like completely black and probably the most effective thing i've ever found for uh getting to sleep is that it's just being surrounded by blackness letting the natural melatonin the pineal gland do its job so awesome uh, yes it's it, 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 it's good yeah. to know i've got at least one thing on my side already so <laughs> so yeah in actual fact was very interesting it was a big study done in britain where they interviewed ladies and they asked them a very simple question. What they just said was, how much light is in your, your bedroom at night? And obviously they can't say in lux. So they said, well, you know what, just tell us one of three possibilities. Mm -hmm. If when you're in your bed, can you see your hand? 
And if you can't see your hand, then they would say, well, you know what, you are sleeping in the dark. Then they said, well, you know, can you see a, a little bit? And they would say, well, you, you're sort of sleeping in like intermediate light. And then <laughs> can you see everything? You know, could you actually yeah. find something in the middle of the night? And a lot of people can, and I, we, I live in South Africa, security is a big issue. So we've got lights everywhere, everywhere, because you, it's a security thing. But it turned out that the ladies that were sleeping in the dark were the thinnest. Interesting. So as soon, and, and those that were sleeping in, in a much more light were actually the fattest. So definitely circadian rhythm is so, so important. So sleeping in the dark is important. You identified there's ways of doing it. So you said you are using a mask, mm -hmm. all right? Yep. Um, it, it's a bit of, it can be a bit irritating uh, initially, but you know what, you get over it and you, yep. you essentially are able to cover up. The other thing you are also using, um, you said tape, yeah. you can buy very expensive curtains. They call them blackout curtains mm. that block the light so that when you get into bed, you are genuinely in the dark and that will help to maximize mm. the, the release of melatonin and help to set that circadian rhythm. So also your behaviors you're, you're, just before you go to bed are important as well. So if you're watching TV or the computer or whatever, you are mm. getting a lot of light. So there are ways that you can sort of mitigate that as well. I don't know if you've ever heard of the blue, uh, the, the blue blocker glasses. Yeah, yeah, you've sure. Seen them? Um, also, just turn the thing off yeah. before you go to bed. Always Hello. Works. It's like, you know, you don't actually have to be on or, or worse still, people get into bed and then they look at their phone for, you know, catch up on Facebook right. or whatever. And then they turn it off. But you've been exposed to light all of that time. So that's going to impact how quickly you fall asleep. So I think mm -hmm. for somebody who's got um, no, no gallbladder, setting the timing is much, much more important than maybe for someone with. Okay, so you're saying the people who've had the gold bladder right, should take a trip to IKEA, get themselves some uh, black blackout curtains. Definitely, <laughs> um, and and also I think also change your morning behaviors mm -hmm. because um, I, let me tell you what I do personally. So no matter what what goes on, I always make sure that I spend at least thirty minutes outside. Um, so it you can do different things. You can um, if you if you if you want to catch up on your uh, sort of Facebook, take the phone with your and go out right. outside. Podcast. Have your morning coffee outside. Mm. Read outside. Don't make the mistake. I think a lot of people say, well, you know what? I'm driving to work, so I'm I'm in the car. Mm, I'm outside. Mm -hmm. uh, the definition of outside is there mustn't be anything between you and the sun. So okay. although a window does let light in, it unfortunately keeps some of the wavelengths out. So you need to actually put yourself outside for, they don't really know for exactly how long, but mm. aim for at least 30, 30 minutes every day. Um, and try and do it more or less at the same time every day as well. Because mm. obviously, you, you again, if, if you do it uh, one morning at six o'clock and the next morning at 11 o'clock, that's not really helping the circadian, the circadian rhythm. Mm. Whatever you do, make sure it's before 12 o'clock in the day. So it's not going to help you say, well, you know what? I'll work in my office all day and you know what, I'll take a walk at five o'clock in the afternoon and I'm outside. That'll, that'll do. It won't. You need the light early in the day, not late at night to actually get that rhythm. It will help you sleep better. But again, it's also going to help with all those other hormones because it's that light that's setting the rhythm. Okay um great so that that's uh that's that's definitely one thing that i think people should do 30 minutes in the morning get a listen to a podcast go for a walk uh i guess even if it's even if it's rainy maybe there's something like a break in the rain that people can do 
Um, do you have any thoughts with regard to food? The big question. And, uh, you know, a lot of people after their gallbladder removal, I've recently started a low fat diet. Um, but one thing you mentioned before we started this interview is you'd sort of advise a bit of caution around um, a very high carbohydrate intake. So do you have any tentative suggestions regarding uh, okay it's a it's a tough one okay because essentially the reason why you're putting on weight is you have this thing called insulin resistance and i've already said to you well the problem is that the insulin is high morning noon and night mm -hmm. uh, and i don't think insulin is a bad guy the problem is the insulin is high when he's supposed to be low. So then we have to say, well, what controls insulin? So there's obviously a lot of things that can control insulin, but insulin's chief job is to put away sugar, right? He puts away my, in my cartoon world, I talk about him, I say, he puts away the groceries, <laughs> but the grocery that he's most interested in is definitely sugar. He's a little bit interested in protein. He's largely not interested in fat. In mm. actual fact, if you sort of think about it, this is how I think about it, you can almost imagine that there's two parallel lines uh, going on. So the one line is to deal with the sugars and the amino acids, and insulin is in charge of that. And the other line is the fats and the bile acids are in charge of that. So as soon as you are eating lots of carbs, you are inevitably increasing insulin levels. Mm -hmm. And the higher your insulin levels, the more vulnerable you are to metabolic problems because ultimately that is what they are. You become non-responsive to insulin. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yes, there's the rub. If you are going to eat a, um, a high carb diet, just simply by that fact, you're going to have more insulin circulating. Now on paper, it should only be circulating during the day when you're eating. It shouldn't be circulating at night. But as the body chemistry breaks, the insulin levels rise at night and that is where your problem is. Mm. Right. So my advice generally is follow a low carb, higher fat diet. Mm, but your eyes exactly. are going to pop out and say, well, that's yeah. great, but I can't do that. Um, so I think it is, it, it's something you just have to be, you have to find where your boundary is. Um, in terms of how much fat you can eat and how much, because if you can't digest it, it isn't going to help, is it? Yeah. So that would be the first thing. It would be better to follow a lower carb diet. Do I think you should follow a no carb diet, all right, or an extremely low carb diet, which is the ketogenic diet. So mm -hmm. by definition, a no carb diet is a carnivore diet and a low carb diet is a ketogenic. I don't think so. I think you have to understand every time you eat, all of those nutrients are sending messages. So the fat sends messages, the protein sends messages, the carbs send messages. So in order to be at the best when you eat something, you probably want all three. You want a little bit of fat, a little bit of carb and a little bit of protein mm -hmm. so that you maximize the messaging. So it's not a case of that you should have no carbs, but you, the, the less you can kind of, or well, the more you can get to, I call it the rule of thirds. You've got a little bit of everything the better off you are because you're getting all the signaling. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The other thing in terms of diet. So the other thing in terms of diet is timing. So I've said to you, as we've been going along, the real problem is that the insulin is high at night. The insulin release is triggered primarily by carbs. You don't want to be eating 
at night. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the other thing to do is play around with your ratios, try and get to a point where you're eating as low a carb or as high a fat as you can tolerate, but also watch when you, when you start and when you stop eating. So the later at night you eat, the more likely you'll have insulin in your system. Insulin will be high during the night doing bad things. If you can move your eating window so that you are not eating so late at night, the insulin will rise and on paper it will fall again so that when you're in bed, the insulin levels are as low as possible. Because mm -hmm. ultimately it's the insulin that makes you fat. Because I said to you, his job is to put away the groceries. So he's putting away the groceries. And when he's putting away the groceries, you are getting fatter. Mm. That's, he's not bad. That's, that is his job. Right. You just don't want him putting away groceries at night because at night, that's when you should be reaching into the cookie jar and burning the things that you've stored during the course of the day. I think also just to, just to say that anybody that hasn't checked out your YouTube channel, Better Body Chemistry, really should because you have this fascinating uh, cartoon world, as you described it, with all these all these uh, very sort of hard to understand concepts as caricatures. I lo absolutely love the gallbladder video and the little guys kicking around uh, the nutrients on a soccer field. So uh yeah it's really 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 enter, 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 entertaining way of explaining science yeah I, th I think if you the more you can understand the terminology i think it's easier to do it isn't it mm -hmm. yeah I, I think if somebody i i'm sure it's, it's happened to people like, don't do this don't do that don't do the other and i think secretly a lot of us inside just stand up and say we'll do it anyway yeah. <laughs> don't tell me what not to do right. but i think the more you can understand it uh, the more the easier it is to apply the principles and unfortunately with biology I think we're all different it's it's so amazing that we are different but we mm. all are different and right. so what works for one person really may not work for somebody else yeah so I, I, the I more you can sense. understand the biology you can start to say well how does that biology apply to me because it might not apply the same to somebody somebody else okay great so uh those are two two great things in terms of sleep and diet any other things you'd recommend it was a little bit out there but i think one of the the things that to understand what the bile acid does so i've said to you they do lots of things via those receptors um and a lot of the things that they're doing are inside the gut, but they also work outside of the gut. Um, and, and it's the levels that are so important. But one of the things that they do do is they actually help you to burn more fat. All right. Literally, they, they help you to burn more fat. They increase energy expenditure. Mm. So obviously, if you're starting to become a pudge, it's because you're not burning quite as much fat as you would like. Part of the problem is going to be that circadian rhythm. I've just said to you, mm. you actually only really burn fat at night. Or the other time you're going to burn fat is when there's a big demand, which is when you're doing exercise. I don't think anybody needs to tell everybody that they need to exercise. This is right. everybody knows, right? Um, it's like the standard advice, eat less, move more. So um, that's one way to, uh, to essentially burn more fat. But a very interesting thing that bile acids actually do is there's different kinds of fats. So we have fat that is kind of the bad fat and called white fat. Mm -hmm. And then we have fat that is good fat and it's called brown fat. And it's prim primarily uh, around your neck. That's where it, it is. So brown fat is what keeps you warm. And it turns out bile acids actually trigger that brown fat. So it's among their many, many jobs that they, mm -hmm. they do. Now, they're not the only thing that triggers brown fat, but there are other chemicals that trigger brown fat, but there's also behaviors that trigger brown fat. 
So one of the things that you can do to trigger brown fat is actually just get a little bit cold. Mm. Um, so th th there's all sorts of ways of doing that. So it can be as simple as, you know what, just put the air conditioner on in the office a little bit lower yeah. for a period of time. Um, not, not you don't necessarily want it to be so low that you <laughs> and have to put six jerseys on, right. but a little bit lower just will help you to increase the brown fat. More extreme versions of that. I'm sure you've seen videos of it on YouTube mm. where they dive into ice cold yeah. water and do the same thing. Um, but interestingly enough, it probably benefit all of us. But again, remember, in, once you've got your gallbladder out, you actually haven't got all the things that the bile assets might be able to do. Right. And this is one thing that they can do. They can actually stimulate thermogenesis. Mm. So you could explore. It's a little bit, it's kind of a little bit out there, but it yeah. may be worth it. You can explore actually ways that you can stimulate thermogenesis without using the bile acid. So I'm um, currently sitting outside, which is unusual for me in the morning. I'm usually very much in my uh, home office and it's absolutely freezing out here. So, so far- Oh, my, so you're uh, getting it. <laughs> so far, you my, haven't my, got uh, 16 jerseys on. <laughs> my, my day is off to an unexpectedly good start from a uh, gallbladder perspective then. Definitely. Cool. Um, so Dr. Dr. Sandy, thank you um, so much for all that information. As I said, I'm to you. Um, I'm going to uh, share this interview, put up on this YouTube channel. I'll be up by the time people watch this and just share it with, because uh, I know there's such a, um, there's a huge, there's a huge gulf, or this is what I've, I've observed anyway, between sort of the way the medical community talks about gallbladder surgery, which is basically, uh, you know, I, I think my surgeon told me, you can go back to work tomorrow if you want, which is a complete exaggeration because I would have been in a lot of pain at that point. But, you know, there's just this very dismissive attitude. And then afterward, there's a lot of people uh, like me that are sort of getting fat. I've, you know, other digestive things I've mentioned in another video. And we're just trying to make sense of this kind of cascade of health problems and sort of get back to where we were before the surgery. So mm. I think your all the information you've given uh, has given me a ton of uh, insight into what's going on in my body, uh, ways I can do it, whether that's jumping into a lake or um, also really a lot, a lot of things to think about with regard to uh, diet and maybe that low fat is not the right direction for a lot of people to, to go down. It's a pleasure. I think the, the real question is, what started it to begin with? Mm. So if you go back, you had goal, a gallstone, am I correct? Uh, for me, I, I kind of had an ache. I, I, it's, uh, it's, okay. I, I might cut this out of the interview. It, it's a bit dodgy. There was an ache. They're like, oh, we'll send you for an ultrasound. And they didn't find any gallstones on the uh, pathology. So I, I, I kind of have this feeling I got an organ put out of me for no reason, but so, something like that, sludge. Even there is where... The problems begin because they're often telling you that the reason why you've got gold stones is because there's too much cholesterol. Mm. But actually, if you have a look at it, gold, the, the gold, gold bladder or the bile is not just cholesterol, it's cholesterol phospholipids and bile acids. And if you start to have a look, the problem was probably before it even hit that you actually didn't have enough bile acid. It wasn't that you had too much cholesterol. It was actually that you didn't have enough bile acids to begin with. So it's very conceivably possible that there's already a problem there. You, aren't, mm. you haven't got enough bile acids and then you come along and you actually take the bile acids that you have out the picture and make it even, even worse. So, so, yes. I think that, that's, that's what a lot of people find is that all their kind of pre-existing uh, health issues just get like kind of drastically multiplied after the surgery. So that makes sense. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of why it's safe is because it's such an easy procedure. Whereas if you look sort of in, in times gone by when they did a surgery like that, it took a long time to recover. That is why they see it as safe. Mm. But the consequences are, I don't think they're, I don't think they're clearly understood. And as I said to you earlier, maybe I should just say it again, mm -hmm. 
we don't know that much about the gallbladder because the models that we're studying don't necessarily do it the same way. So rats mm. don't have a gallbladder. Mice, they have different, different bile acids. So there's so much information that is not known, which is why you end up having your gallbladder out without the realization of the consequences. Right. That's that's something that I, I've noticed that this, um, if I'm not mistaken, this kind of uh, research into the metabolic signaling role of the gallbladder that you, you've discussed in this interview is relatively new. So I was looking at the history of uh, cholecystectomy, that the first open one was in the 19th century. Lapar laparoscopy is relatively new, newer, if I'm not mistaken. So it's mm -hmm. not a ton of time that humans have actually been living without gallbladder so we're kind of guinea guinea pigs or i guess maybe guinea rodents might be a better analogy uh based on, on what you said about having no gallbladders once you've had it out you are developing this thing called insulin resistance but right now they don't even know what insulin resistance is you can ask a hundred experts and they'll tell you it's something different but what they do know is you are not responding appropriately to insulin that's what insulin resistance is. But despite all the science and all the studies and the fact they've known this for so, they still don't even know what insulin resistance is. So yes, and the gallbladder is like the teeny part on the side of mm. insulin resistance. So yes, I think there's a lot of, it, it, there's a lot of work still to be done. And yeah, I think a lot of it's not even looking in the right places, but yeah. <laughs> A lot of work still to be done, but you've you've uh, given those of us in this uh, situation, I think, a bit of a, a bit of hope and encouragement. Uh, Dr. Sandy, if people wanted to find out more about uh, you, you've got a really entertaining YouTube channel, as I mentioned. You've got a website. Uh, can you tell us where, where where to find those? Well, probably the best thing is just to go to my um, my website. So it's betterbodychemistry.com, um, and you can then link to the the YouTube channel from there or I've also got a lot of free resources. Um, unfortunately, at this point in time, not really designed to help people with their gallbladders out. I was trying to stop you from having it out in the first place. <laughs> but a lot of resources for people who are insulin resistant and struggling with their weight. So some of them are very much uh, tied to actually managing or dealing with the insulin part of the insulin resistance. Mm. But there's also things not not everybody who has a weight problem has a problem with insulin. Mm -hmm. However, I'm going to say, I'll put my neck, what, head on a block and say, everybody who's had their gallbladder out has got a problem with insulin because mm. the, bile, the bile acid is actually controlling that insulin loop. Okay. Makes it, no. Good, good and bad to know okay. at the same time. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandy. Re really appreciate your time today. It was a pleasure. Thank you.